start, and hopefully before you look at the source sheet, which some people already looked at, I know, um, what I kind of want to ask and see what people think. What what is Hanukkah? What what are we what are we celebrating? Okay, it is a, ooh, that was a great answer. It gr Great as in very specific and detailed. Um, it is a victory, it is a celebration of the victory of the Maccabees over the Seleucids. Great. Anybody else? What else are we celebrating on Hanukkah? Or what else might we be celebrating on Hanukkah? Or what else did you learn we're celebrating on Hanukkah? Or what do you think? Or what do you feel? Okay, so the rededication of the Hanukkah to Mizbeach, the rededication of the temple, connected, maybe? Maybe not, don't wanna put words in Marshall's mouth. Okay, anything else? Okay, so the fact that, okay, so the fact that the Seleucids defiled the temple and it had to be rededicated. Great. Anybody else? Anybody know anything else about Hanukkah? Think anything else about Hanukkah? Eight nights of oil. So the miracle of the oil they found in this rededication, they found a tiny, the word is cruise, which is a really cool word. Um, the, a tiny jug of oil that lasted, should have lasted for one day, lasted for eight. It's a story about not assimilating. Okay. Great. So I will. So Marshall notes that Hanukkah, and I will add, like Purim, happens much after the, the Torah. And so it's in a historical holiday. So it is not in any books of Torah. Unlike Purim, it is not in any books of Tanakh. It is in the Apocrypha. Um, as we'll see a little later, it also appears in the canon. I believe in the Catholic canon, you get some of the books of Maccabees. Um, okay, so Hanukkah is really interesting. Um, so we're going to kind of go on this journey of where do we find Hanukkah? What is Hanukkah? What does Hanukkah mean for us in, we'll see where it goes. Um, so the first source here is from Mishnah Shabbat. So I really just brought it because ultimately the Gemara is going to connect to it. So I won't read the whole thing, but to summarize, um, it's got a great summary in the English. Thank you to Safaria for having this all at our fingertips. This Mishnah cites a list of fuels and wicks that one may not use in kindling the Shabbat lights. Okay, great. The Mishnah is gonna tell us what you can and can't light Shabbat candles with. And it goes on and it tells us about these different things, cedar bast, uncombed flax, raw silk, all of these things. I don't know about you, I don't light my Shabbat candles with any of these things. You do you. And then, so the Gemara, which is the sort of fleshing out discussion, difference of opinion sometimes on Mishnah, on Shabbat, on this section, we find the first mention of Hanukkah. And I've brought two sources from the Gemara, and I have them in the order that they appear. So this is 21a on the front side of the page. I'm just going to, I know it's a lot of my voice, but for the sake of everyone online, I'm just going to read. Rav Huna said, those wicks and oils with which the sages said that one may not light the lamp on Shabbat, one may not light with them on Hanukkah. Great. I should have said nothing about Hanukkah, but here we are. So this is the first mention of Hanukkah. Does anyone find anything particularly interesting or challenging or unique or something about this? Nothing said about the holiday. Great. Yeah. Why are they lighting lights on Hanukkah? Nothing said about the holiday. Great. So Gemara is this really interesting, I love studying Gemara. I find it really interesting. Um, Gemara, when it comes to discussing Halakha, sometimes takes, there's this thought that it kind of takes two approaches. Sometimes it really looks at a verse and it's really trying to figure out what the verse is telling us, 
what we're deriving from it, what are we supposed to do in such and such case? And sometimes the rabbis of the Gemara look out at the world around them and they see famously what the people are doing. And then they ask the question and they work their way backwards. They know that this is what is being done and they assume that their reader knows that this is what is being done. And so they talk about it as if it's already there and they bring proofs to a thing that likely they were already doing. And this to me is such a great example. They don't feel the need to define Hanukkah first. They just tell you, if you can't light with it on Shabbat, you can't light with it on Hanukkah. And then when you flip the page of the Gemara, I get to flip the page of my source sheet at the same time. Yours might be, I think, a little bit shorter. We have the most, probably the most famous passage on Hanukkah, the most, one of the most famous questions, my Hanukkah. What's the deal with Hanukkah, as I like to say? What's Hanukkah? Why Hanukkah? How Hanukkah? My Hanukkah. So I'm this one I will read because I think this is going to give us our first sort of reason for it. The Gemara asks, what is Hanukkah? Also, just, you know, if you're looking at this, the bolded parts are the words that actually come out of the Gemara, and the unbolded are the sort of elucidations that help us figure out what's going on. So I'm going to mostly stick to the bolded parts unless it's really necessary. What is Hanukkah? The sages taught on the 25th of Kislev, the days of Hanukkah are eight. One may not eulogize on them and one may not fast on them. When the Greeks entered the sanctuary, shout out to Marshall, they defiled all the oils that were in the sanctuary. And when the Hasmonean monarchy overcame and emerged victorious over them, shout out to Malka, they searched and found only one cruise of oil that was placed with the seal of the high priest. And there was sufficient oil there to light for only one day. A miracle occurred and they lit for it from eight days. Lit from it eight days. Words are hard, apparently. The next year, the sages instituted those days and made them holidays with hallel and special thanksgiving. Great. So we see here that they're likely celebrating this miracle of the oil a little bit it talks it touches on the military victory but i would argue that the focus here is the eight days of the of the oil so it makes sense it connected it with the oil so it might make sense that the talmud thinks that this is the primary reason for the holiday you don't have any thoughts of a couple like maybe confused looks no yeah. T oh. Totally. Totally. So we have, could it be possibly, Tom asks, could it be possibly that the question my Hanukkah here is why is Hanukkah mentioned? here in the Gemara, that the, it's not a general my Hanukkah question, it's a very specific why here is the Gemara talking about it, and maybe that's why they particularly draw in the connection to the miracle of the lights. I haven't thought about that. Malka? So Malka asks, or Malka states, um, that she wonders why the rabbis want to play down the military victory. So I have a lot of thoughts on that. I'm going to put a pin in that question because I want to come back to it later um, because it really relates to something coming later. Or at least. So Marlies, uh, Marlies says she heard that the miracle of the lights might not have happened and what is the source for it not having happened or having happened i um i'll be honest i don't know off the top of my head this is where it first comes according to rabbi rebecca schatz um this is where it first comes this is the first mention we have of it
we go. Great. Um, so we have we've had some lovely discussion just that I'm going to repeat for everybody on Zoom and on YouTube about where does this first arrive. Um, and so it might come up in in Ta'ani where it talks about a list of the holidays, but it might just be listed there and it might not tell the story of the eight days. Un Un Rabbi Shatz has something to say. She has her hand raised. I thought you were just going to say it into the mic for me, but that's fine. She's with a special cameo by Rabbi Shatz. Well, I just wanted to say that, um, especially because Joel Cooper is on here right now. Yes, I am wearing gloves. I'm freezing. Um, that um, that it says that we don't eulogize on Hanukkah. There are many holidays for which we don't eulogize. This past week, we had two funerals, so uh, and we gave eulogies at all of them. The, the way that the rabbis get around that is by saying something along the lines of, Today is a day of Hanukkah. We try to focus on things that are going to keep us happy and keep us celebrating a festival. And yet, it's also a mitzvah to celebrate someone's life and to make mention of who the person was. And so that's how we then do eulogies during a festival. Any festival that has this as a rule, we get around it and still do eulogies. Um, so I just wanted to make sure those of you who are connected to the to the different funerals that, that happened this past week, I just wanted to make mention of that halacha uh, in accordance to this. I'm very glad I didn't have to summarize that. Marshall. I feel like this one's really hot. Um, so Marshall points us towards the Hebrew that it says Lishana Acheret Kivaum Vaasum Yamim Tovim Bahalel Vehoda. So he points that Lishana Acheret doesn't have to mean the next year, that it means another year, and that because Steinsholz is adding into the stages, that there may have been a period in which this wasn't celebrated. There's a lot of commentary. There's a lot of commentary on that in the Gemara. So Next up, I've brought a later halachic work from the, the Arucha Shulchan, written by Rabbi Yechiel Michael Epstein in the late 1800s. So we're jumping, we're taking a huge jump here. Um, he tends to take the more lenient opinion on things, um, but also he was a full-time rabbi. He wasn't just an, an author of scholarly works or author of halacha. Um, so many authorities, um, including Rav Moshe Feinstein, weigh this work really highly because he was actually out and rabbiing and making decisions for people to live their lives by on a regular basis. And so he says, another reason for this is elucidated in the book of Maccabees. Since, as a result of the decrees, they were stopped from bringing the sacrifices of the holiday of the past Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret. And hence, to commemorate this, they made the eight days of Hanukkah. And it followed that when from the heavens they were shown the miracle of oil, they... I let, You know what? I'm going to stop there. This is in there, and it makes a lot more sense in the Hebrew. This is one of those really complicated back and forth, but I will say that it does at the very end, and in commemoration of this miracle, they fix the candles be lit on Hanukkah. And it is about, it is also about the eight days, but what I thought was interesting really was this beginning about the book of Maccabees. So, um, I did look in, so Arucha Shulchan lines up its its order with the tour and the Shulchan Aruch. So I went to look at the Shulchan Aruch just to see. And Shulchan Aruch gives us no commentary. He just gives us the halacha on it as he is prone to do. It is a book of halacha. But I also found the book of Maccabees source on this because I thought it was interesting. Um, this is not in our canon. So I've brought sources, um, a couple of sources from Maccabees. I think they're both from Maccabees too, um, which both do not appear in our canon. 
And a little bit to Mulga's point, and I'm not going to ask the question, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to open the question, but I'm going to ask it and hope it percolates and then come back to it after the second source of Maccabees. But I want to consider that there was, there were people, historical humans, who made the decision on what did or did not become part of Tanakh, of what we accepted into our canon and what we did not. And I just want to think about, like, I want to put out there to think on why might these books have not made it into the canon? So I will read a little bit from Maccabees. Um, and so this is coming at the end of this fight. Um, and at the end of all these, they fell on their faces and they pleaded to the Lord God saying, please God, protect us forever from this trouble that's come to us. And if we have sinned against you, sorry, there's a very loud car. If we have sinned against you, punish us with kindness and do not give us any longer into the hands of strangers who are cursing the name of your holiness. And from the Lord, it was this, to purge the house on the same day that the nations defiled it. And it was the 25th day of the month of Kislev. And they celebrated the festival to the Lord for eight days, like the festival of Sukkot. And they remembered the previous days when they celebrated of the festival of Sukkot in the mountains and in the caves. And they went out in the desolation like wild beasts. And they took the willows of the brook and the branches of the palm trees, and they sang a song of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, who gave them courage and salvation to purify the temple of his holiness. And they sent a voice in all the cities of Judah to celebrate this festival every year. So now we've sort of got two options, though after Tom's comment, I feel a little shakier on the first one. But we're going to say that the Gemara tells us that it's about the miracle of the oil. And now this one really seems like a replacement for Sukkot. Um, does anyone have any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Mahlokit? If not, that's fine. I'm happy to. This is the connection to Sukkot. No. Rabbi Shatz. <laughs> So Rabbi Schatz mentioned that she learned a number of years ago from Alan Brady that there was, historically, there were people who, when they could not celebrate Sukkot, would celebrate some of the rituals of Sukkot on Hanukkah. They would take something similar to a lulav, and they would do similar, not the dwelling in the sukkah, but other things that were resemblant. So there's sort of a historical, historical piece to this, um, that people really did do this. We just had a clarifying about when it happened. Um, so, you know, they say two Jews, three opinions. So there are more than two of us here. So thankfully, we're going to bring a third opinion in case you are concerned. So we've got a third. We've got a third option. This is the Al Hanisim. I took it out of Birkat Hamazon because this is conveniently where Safaria has it the easiest to get. But it is the same Al Hanisim that appears in the Amidah. Um, and so it begins, we thank thee for the miracles, for the redemption, for the mighty deeds and saving acts wrought by thee, as well as for the wars which thou didst wage for our fathers in days of old at this season. 
I know lots of people here, some people here like the word thy and thou, but if it's all right, I'm not going to read this entire thing and I will summarize. Um, this really talks about the military victory. Um, it is also the beginning is the same that we say on Purim and then on Purim we, we have a different story and we tell the story of Purim. Here we tell the story in the days of the Hasmonean of Matitsyahu, the high priest, and about it's, it's something that I think is interesting is it tells the story when the iniquitous power of Greece rose up against thy people, Israel, to make them forgetful of thy law. So here it's really pinning it and saying the Greeks made the Jews do this thing. And then it goes on about all of the things that God has done for the people. And then uh, thereupon thy children came into the oracle, cleansed the temple, purified the sanctuary, kindled the lights, and appointed these eight days of Hanukkah in order to give thanks and praise us. So based on what you're reading, what you might know, this quick summary, where does al Hanisim seem to be pointing us? So, so Bob's doubling down on lights. He's taking his stand. It's about lights, that it mentions the lights here, that the big thing, which were mentioned earlier, it, the big thing is that it, of Sukkot used to be the water libation ceremony, which happened at night, surrounded by lights. Bob is taking his claim on lights. Hanukkah is about lights. Great. He has good arguments, as David, like, as David is saying. Anyone? Oh. <laughs> Great. Great. Anyone else have... Now there's a helicopter if you can't hear it on Zoom. <laughs> Anyone have else? Yeah. Okay, so we've got the question, we've got the assertion, question, statement, thought um, that it's probably about a military victory in a civil war and there was lots of bloodshed and the Talmud might be trying to play that down a little bit and put it on the Greeks and say, why did this happen? So I, you should just know that on my, on my notes that I wrote for myself, I have, and I quote, doesn't say who the military victory was against. So. You have nailed exactly where my next point is going. So we're going to go back to Maccabees, which I, this to me was one of the most interesting things I read in preparing for this. Um, I've learned a lot about Hanukkah in the last number of years of my life. This is a story that technically that comes from the Apocrypha that comes, that is, that is preserved as Holy Scripture in that sort of way in the Catholic canon. Um, this piece did not, this piece only existed in a Christian translation, and I did not feel like sitting and translating the whole thing. So this came out of the new revised, new revised standard version of the Christian Bible. Um, it is, it is not part of our canon, I will tell you, you can, you are welcome to take it or leave it. That is all of my disclaimers on citing the Christian Bible before I do it. Um, so Jason was one of the high priests, um, and he shouldn't have been there. There's a story about how he got there. And this is the, um, sorry, the helicopter is now circling. Um, it is, this is a story about him as he is the leader who came to power through not such great methods. He set aside the existing royal concessions to the Jews, secured through John, the father of Eupolemus, who went on the mission to establish friendship and alliance with the Romans. And he destroyed the lawful ways of living and introduced new customs contrary to the law. He took delight in establishing a gymnasium right under the citadel. <laughs> and he induced the noblest of the young men to wear the Greek hat. There was such an extreme of Hellenization and increase in the adoption of foreign ways because of the surpassing wickedness of Jason, who was ungodly and no true high priest 
that the priests were no longer intent upon their service at the altar. Despising the sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, they hurried to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the wrestling arena after the signal for the discus throwing, disdaining the honors prized by their ancestors and putting the highest value upon Greek forms of prestige. For this reason, heavy disaster overtook them and those who were, whose ways of living they admired and wished to imitate completely became their enemies and punished them. It is no light thing to show a reverence to the divine laws, a fact that later events will make clear. So here's sort of the lead up. We talked a little about, someone said it was a holiday about assimilation. Um, and so here we kind of see what happened. And then we get some, some, in, some intensity, which is, this is where I wanna hang the question and I wanna bring it back quickly. Maybe why isn't this in our canon? When a false rumor arose that Antiochus was dead, Jason took no fewer than a thousand men and suddenly made an assault on the city. When the troops on the wall had been forced back and at last the city was being taken, Menelaus took refuge in the citadel, but Jason kept relentlessly slaughtering his compatriots, not realizing that success at the cost of one's kindred is the greatest misfortune. But imagining that he was setting up trophies of victory over enemies and not over compatriots, he did not, however, gain control of the government. In the end, he got only disgrace from his conspiracy and fled again into the country of the Ammonites. Finally, he met a miserable end. <sighs> dun, dun, dun. So here we have this story that I don't know about anyone else. I had never read this before. And so I thought it was really interesting that this brings in I'm going to assume most of us learned it as the victory of the Jews over the Greeks or the Seleucids, if you're a little bit better at history than I am. And this brings a whole whole new light to it, at least to me. I don't have any thoughts on it. What? Oh, yeah. So David asked me to elaborate. What do I see in it? So I see here really, really this this undercurrent of this the destruction of jews at the hands of other jews that jason this high priest or disgraced high priest um went out and killed jews and said like this is not this is not not a good situation and kind of this jewish on jewish violence that wasn't i never learned it in hebrew school So there's so the question has been asked where does this happen in the in the arc of the narrative um in the story that we know and i will say for myself um this is not anywhere in the arc of the narrative that i ever learned in my life and i all i find it hard to pin down of does this come before or after where this sort of falls in that it a lot of it seems to happen all at once um and also, it, it's complicated also because when you look at, I want to say it's Maccabees 3 and 4, you get a slightly different account of the order of the story. Um, the books of Maccabees, four of them exist, and they all tell sort of different pieces and in slightly different ways. Um, and it is a little hard to historically verify these stories. Um, it is likely that some of this happened in some sort of it is very likely that some of this happened we have lots of historical records they're just a little fuzzy around the edges of timeline
Yeah, so David's point is that it seems that there are two groups of Jews who could have done this defeating. Um, it could have been these Jews that were more Hellenized, or it could have been the Hashmonaim, who we would have, and Judaism would have looked very different depending on what had happened in that moment. Um, so I, so I, I brought this source to muddy the water a little. That was why I brought it. So clearly it worked. Um, but I want to go back now to our original question. What, what is Hanukkah celebrating? Um, just, just to sum it up really quickly and then kind of open back up for thoughts. So we sort of have these three and a half ish options. We have the Talmud gives us the miracle of the oil that lasted for eight days. The book of Maccabees, the first time, gave us the, the Sukkot, that it's making up for Sukkot that was missed when the temple couldn't be used. And then we have al Hanisim that clearly, clearly thinks it was a military victory, pretty clearly, although Bob is staking his claim in lights, which is great. I love it. Um, two Jews, three's opinions. And likely going with the military victory three and a half who was the military victory um so all of that all of that in front of you and all of the murkiness and all of the questions my hanukkah yeah I love that. So a summary um, for those of you on Zoom who couldn't hear it, Bob's got two points. One, history is written by the victor. This is some sort of historical event, and but we're getting the perspective of whoever survived to write it down. And also, canonization is a process, and it's about um, it's about coming together. And so in that process, it's trying to figure out what is a story that will unite people around this canon and what will be more comfortable um, and that clearly people were celebrating Hanukkah and it's clearly something that was happening and they had to find a way to tell the story in a way that was comfortable. And so this was not so comfortable necessarily. Malka. So Malka brings up the point that in some ways it feels similar to Purim, that there are sources that say that Purim might have been someone else's holiday that we adopted and added our own story to. I think the connections between Hanukkah and Purim are like numerous and fascinating. And one that I thought was so interesting that I never noticed before this year, especially when you look at, when you look at really, when you look at Maccabees particularly, but when you look even at the Talmud, if you don't, look at al Hanisim, which is in a particular context of prayer, less so than Purim, but also God to some extent is still missing from the story. And I think that's also a really interesting piece of it, 
in Al Hanisim we do see the presence of God, and this is what God did for the people. But that, but Al Hanisim was written in the context of prayer and to praise and to think. But I think it's interesting that we don't that we don't see it. There's, does anyone have any other final thoughts before I wrap up? I realize, sorry, I should ask one more. Yeah, Marsha. Interesting. So Marshall brought a teaching from Rabbi Shlomo Riskin yeah. that connects it to the Parsha to Parsha Noach, and about how somebody mentioned in the Parsha of Noach being great um, is likely a pre is is a predecessor of the Greeks. And so the question came up: How do you take these great teachings and incorporate it under the Jewish under the Jewish tent and that challenge, um, which adds a whole new level of interesting to that tension in the story of the military victory, also of how do you how do you defeat this people while also incorporating them. And their wisdom. Um, something that I read this year by one of our professors, um, Rabbi Dr. Arya Cohen, was about something that I loved that um, I want to leave you all with, is that Hanukkah is a unique holiday, that it's diasporic, and that we do it wherever we are. And that we ultimately, the mitzvah of Hanukkah is the, is Persume Nisa, is that we are, is that we're publicizing this miracle. And it might be that the miracle is a military victory, and it might be that the miracle is that the oil lasted for eight days. And it might be that the miracle is that we're still here after all of these years and all of these challenges. And I think that Hanukkah that happened clearly after the time of the Tanakh and clearly after and amidst and among all of these struggles that we're still standing here and we celebrate it, I think is a really cool and unique thing about this holiday. <laughs>